Welcome to Essex Wildlife Trust Wilder Communities Programme. Tonight is the Hedgerow Creation Webinar for our Transform with Trees topic. And it is our very last webinar of 2023. And as you all know, it's for our Team Wilder projects, which includes Urban Wildlife Champions, River Champions, Wilder Towns, Wilder Villages and Next Door Nature. I think uh, a few of you on the list here today also joined me last night at the Orchard Creation Webinar. Um, so welcome back. Um, I am Danielle Carbot, though. If you haven't met me before or been on a webinar, I am the Wilder Communities Manager at Essex Wildlife Trust. As always, before we kick off, this is a webinar, so you will not be able to turn on your camera or microphone. But if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat. There's a bubble at the top. There's also a QA and a um, little button as well if you wanted to use that, whichever suits. And then I will try and answer them at the end. Um, there's also, of course, always an opportunity to book in site visits for more bespoke support. So. Today's session, uh, this evening's session, will focus on hedgerow creation. Um, hedgerows are a valuable wildlife corridor across our landscapes. They connect up habitats, aid the movement of wildlife and provide a rich larder throughout the year. You might be planting a brand new hedgerow, replacing one that, that has been removed or simply filling in gaps. Whatever your project plan, this webinar will support your plan and prepare you for your own hedgerow project. First, though, a little intro. So hedgerows, very similarly to our orchard webinar creation yesterday, they are a man-made habitat, um, but this time they're kind of a vertical and dense structure. And they actually provide something called an ecotone, where two or more habitats overlap. So they mimic woodlands, but also hold scrub and grass and habitats too, which really provides a fantastically rich species space. And this is important because many of our species have evolved to utilise that variety and diversity. For example, song thrushes, um, they forage at the base of a hedge, they nest in the shrub layer and then call and sing in the higher layers. Hedgerows are also spatially and uh, temporally dynamic. They mimic different habitats at different stages of growth. And depending on how they're managed uh, and the edge habitats that are encouraged to develop, they can package up layers of habitat in a relatively small space, which is useful, particularly in community spaces where perhaps we don't have the space for those bigger habitat projects. So this unique habitat provides three key elements. One is a physical home. So, so there are lots of different species that will actually use a hedgerow as its home. So it might be nesting birds, hibernating dormice and hedgehogs, many other mammals as well as insects. And it's a great space for overwintering too. Um, so yeah, a great habitat, a home. It can also be a resource as well, though. So not all species will use it as a physical home, but they might, you know, use it for things like food and foraging and hunting, as well as shelter. And then, of course, the one thing that's always kind of talked about when we look at hedgerows is that it is a wildlife corridor. Hedgerows allow species to move and roam across the landscape, and this avoids kind of isolation and fragmentation from, say, other habitats such as woodland. A study was actually uh, published by um, British Wildlife and they counted 2,070 species just in one 85 metre length of hedge in Devon. And this just really highlights what an amazing habitat hedgerows are and the lifeline they provide for our declining species. So if you can imagine 85 metres in length times by the amount of hedgerows that we've already got in the UK, as well as those potential spaces for new planting. And then before I dive into the actual creation of hedgerows, I just wanted to spend a bit of time looking at what constitutes as a good hedge structure. I can talk about hedgerows and how amazing they are, but across the UK there are some amazing examples, but there also are some pretty poor examples too. So this should help provide a picture of what your hedgerow creation project should aim for. So number one, hedgerow trees. 
having key species that are encouraged to grow into mature trees and not managed as a hedgerow is quite important. So when you get um, to the planting stage, tag some of those young sapling, saplings that can be left. Um, and this is known as a stand. So you will have probably have driven past some really established hedgerows where actually there's mature trees that are popping out and that have been left to grow. Um, this helps with the continuity of flower, nuts or fruit, depending on the species you, you pick, as well, in nest, as well as nesting opportunities for a variety of bats and birds at kind of a, a higher height. Number two, tree and shrub species diversity. A hedgerow should not be a monoculture of just one species, but instead of mix of species such as hawthorn, blackthorn, honeysuckle, elder, ivy, bramble, fruit trees even, dog rose and so on. And this will help to support species that are dependent on specific food plants. The more species you have in your hedgerow, the longer flowering uh, season they'll be, the more uh, pollen available and so on. So really that kind of um, variety of species within a hedgerow is really, really important. Number three, height and width. So the taller and wider a hedgerow, the better. This then creates structural diversity. So when managing a hedgerow, um, and we will look at this in more detail, the idea is that slowly over time, they consistently change and steadily get bigger. You don't always want to have this kind of really neat box structured hedgerow. Um, you want to have, you know, quite a kind of a scruffy, unkempt hedgerow. That's the best for wildlife. And number four, again, through management, structural diversity should be achieved. You don't want to create kind of a uniform hedge, but that, that one that has kind of a, a varieties uh, of features. And that picture I've got on the screen there is a really good example of the variety that you might have in a hedgerow. And it kind of demonstrates that ecotone as well. There's so many different overlaps from different habitats there. And similarly, you might also want to ensure hedgerows are dense to the base. And again, this is down to management. You don't want to kind of create leggy hedges um, where you've got gaps all at the bottom. Otherwise, species won't be able to use them for navigation, shelter or nesting. And again, that's due to management. We'll look at that later. And then connectivity, you want to avoid kind of gaps where possible. So as you move uh, through the hedgerow creation, Replanting unsuccessful whips is important and uh, yeah, connectivity to the wilder landscape as well. Um, you know, looking at a hedgerow, not just in isolation, but what it's connecting up to. And then margins, um, number seven, as mentioned, hedgerows are a ecotone where habitats overlap. So you wanna bake that into your plan. Margins such as grassland and scrub encourage those to develop. So it's not just that kind of line of tree species that you're looking after, you're kind of looking after the margins on each side, uh, depending you know, uh, where your hedgerow is going to go. And of course, hedgerows are not just good for wildlife, but can be a, a huge benefit to people. Just like woodlands and other habitats, hedgerows are a great carbon storer. They reduce soil erosion. They can help with flood management. They also provide shelter and shade, particularly in heat stressed urban areas. And ultimately, they can be used instead of fences. So creating a more natural barrier in green and open spaces. And this can in turn help with noise pollution as well as air pollution across these spaces. And just to demonstrate this, I have a small video from the Tree Council all about urban hedgerows. Enjoy. In towns and cities, we can lose touch with nature and the natural environment. Hedges can help you to grow back green, reduce noise and pollution, and provide shade and shelter for people and wildlife. In this film, we will explore how they can improve our lives in the suburban and busy city environments. When we talk about hedges, hedgerows, people often assume we mean rural hedgerows in the farmed landscape. But actually, there's loads of hedges in our towns, cities, and villages in the built up areas where we live, work, and play every day. It's vital that we get these hedges or as many hedges back into urban environments really to help and improve biodiversity. Creating hidey holes for insects to live right the way through to spaces for birds to nest. They're an, an ecological gold mine. It's not just for wildlife, shelter, 
it's all about mitigating as well for climate change, the environment. It can prevent soil erosion, can prevent runoff, you know, from flooding. We get so many benefits from hedgerows in urban areas. They help with air pollution by trapping little particulates and we breathe fewer of them in. They can help with cooling and temperature on hot days. And also they just make the places where we live and work more beautiful. We've put hedges around schools in the urban environment to try and create fresh air zones for the children who are then playing in the playground. So I think hedges are just a critical part of the world that we live in that we can't forget and we can't allow to be removed from the environments we work, rest and play in. We've got potential to do so much more with our urban hedgerows. For starters, we can plant more of them. We don't have to always have walls and fences. We could have lovely, luscious, bushy hedgerows buzzing with wildlife and biodiversity instead. Often we'll see hedges that are just monoculture laurel or conifer. If they were a diverse mix of native species, they're much better for wildlife. We don't have to always have them really trim and tidy, much better for wildlife to just let them be a little bit more unkempt. Find out more about hedges in urban environments, the benefits they can provide and how to care for them in the Hedge Hub. Right, let's now get into the nitty gritty. How do you actually go about creating a hedgerow from scratch in your local community? Because I assume that's why you're all here today. Where you will plant your hedgerow is a good place to start. And as mentioned, with it being a fairly compact habitat, that can be planted in linear or curd limes. The options are quite open. You also don't have to create a hugely long hedgerow. But the most important consideration is, does it connect up habitats and provide a wildlife corridor? Where possible, you don't want to create a hedgerow in isolation. I would therefore suggest mapping out your local area. Where are there already established hedgerows? Where are the gaps between habitats? Where is this habitat missing from the landscape? Simply just go for a walk around your local area and really investigate the best places for your hedgerow creation. And then is, there is an example here on the screen of exactly that, mapping out where those hedgerows are. And it can be really interesting um, kind of research, really, because there might be some hedgerows out there um, that you didn't know existed. Um, and this can happen in both urban, uh, urban and rural areas. Um, and you might have realised that there's, there's more hedgerows in your space, um, but you might also notice massive gaps of habitat that you have overlooked previously. So, yeah, really get, get out there and go and map your area. And, you know, for, for example, playing fields and recreational spaces might benefit from hedgerows instead of fences. Urban parks might not have any connecting habitat as, habitats at all. Uh, paths or small access routes may be creating a break in connectivity. Um, so, yeah, it's, there's lots of things to look at um, and deciding where your hedgerow goes is really important. Uh, recently, I was chatting to a parish council and they came up with this fantastic idea that the play area itself could be demarcated out by planting a hedgerow, which then connected up to a small woodland to the right and then an allotment to the left. It wasn't going to be a particularly long hedgerow, but this was such an imaginative way of designing a local space for both people and wildlife. So just getting out there and, and talking over where your hedgerows can be could bring up some really great ideas. And like any other land based project, when you have identified a suitable space, reach out to the relevant people to share and promote your project idea. You know that 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 space could be on a local uh, local council land. Um, again, housing associations, uh, like in the video, it might be a local school. It might be on, uh, you know, a, a business land. So looking at talking to the site manager or the CEO, just generally yeah, have a look where where you could plant and make connections with those people, depending on, who, you know, who owns that land. And again, within that first initial step, step, it really is important that you do not do it alone. And I really spoke about this yesterday as well in the Orchard uh, Creation webinar to ensure that the project is successful uh, and that you're not including 
and that you're not kind of removing local residents from uh, the decision making you know go out listen to people maybe even try and form a community group to oversee that project as well this could be an informal group you know a set of volunteers or just a network of people that are interested in hedgerows or maybe interested in mapping out your area or it could be a more established and formal group um, and as me uh, mentioned again yesterday uh, in yesterday's webinar if you want more advice on how to set up a community group there's our YouTube channel where there's a playlist. Um, here's some examples on the screen here. Number four, how to become constituted is the one that you want to look at if you do want to set up a sort of formal or informal community group. And once these initial steps have been completed, you have reached the planning stage. First of all, I would choose your species. As mentioned, the best hedges for wildlife are those with a good mix of different species. And in many cases, choosing native species is your best option. Also think about what species might thrive in your local environment. And this will be dependent on local climate, geology and soil. Um, but on the screen here are just some kind of starter pointers. You could go for hawthorn, hazel, dogwood, spindle, gilder rose, holly, hornbeam, rowan bramble field maple dog rose honeysuckle i could actually sit here and, and rule off many many other species but they're kind of a good starter list um if you'd like me to send that kind of starter list to you more than happy to do so do so you can also download this pdf as well which has you know a lovely illustration of some of those native species that you might want to consider planting along within your hedgerow and also find a supplier the widespread use of plants grown from foreign seed is eroding the genetic integri integrity of many of our native species so find a supplier that grows from local seeds or rootstocks where possible um, these are generally available in kind of late autumn and they come uh, or, as, you know, come as bare roots known as whips. These are generally the cheapest and most easily acquired plants um, and they come sort of in 30 to 45 centimetre lengths or 45 to 60 centimetre lengths or 60 to 90 centimetre lengths. So they're not particularly big. Um, and I would probably recommend going for the, the 60 to 90 centimetres, the biggest variety. Um, but whips is the best thing to do um, because you can plant them on mass. And that's very different to the kind of advice I gave yesterday uh, in the Orchard Creation webinar where I recommended buying maidens, which are a year old. Go for whips. It's the best option and much easier for large scale planting. Because um, in most cases, hedgerows are planted in a double staggered row and you need kind of four to six whips per metre. So think about how many you will need to buy. Um, and this is to make it kind of more dense when you do that kind of staggered two row approach and enables you to fit more whips into the space, which will again help with its structure further down the line. The thing to bear in mind with bare roots as well is that they need to be planted within a kind of two to three day window where possible to protect the roots and stop them drying out. If you can't manage that window, you will need to find a strategy to kind of tide them over, perhaps keeping them in compost and regularly watered. So lots to bear in mind there when you're looking for suppliers and the types of uh, yeah, tree planting you want to go for. And again, get your funding. At the moment, very similar again to the Orchard uh, Creation Webinar, the Branching Out Fund included in your last Team Wilder newsletter is accepting applications for community hedgerow establishment. This is generally available every year and here's a screenshot of what they're um, yeah, funding right now. 250 to 2500 with deadlines Sunday the 3rd of December. You've also got more hedges which is a funding option from the woodland trust again here on my screen um, this funding is specifically for hedges and they are looking for kind of new hedging projects of 100 meters or more so kind of larger scale but a very good one to look at if perhaps you're a local uh, parish or town council that's uh, joined the webinar today 
or of course you can look for local funding pots. I do include these in the monthly newsletters where possible, but you ha may have access to more. Um, you know, sometimes local borough, district or city councils have funding pots that you can access. And again, we can support with funding applications and letters of support where appropriate. So reach out if you've got any questions at this stage. But do a little bit of research, see what funding is out there, because there may be some pots that are not just for tree planting or hedgerows. They might just be general environment and conservation funding pots or grants. And then we're on to the planting bit itself. The fun bit, the bit that everybody wants to get involved in and actually a great way to get your community on board. You can make it into an event, invite lots of people, include your local primary school or secondary school, scouts, guides, cubs, brownies, you name it, invite them, see who's interested in joining you. And of course, it will be your formed community group or network of volunteers that will be running this day. Um, but it's really important to use your plan at this point. So use markers to mar map out your hedgerow on the land you intend to plant. Mark out where the holes need to be dug and measure out the spacing needed between each whip. This will ensure that the structure and shape of your hedgerow is solid, as well as giving you kind of that visual image of what the hedgerow will look like before you've actually planted. Sometimes you might need to tweak it. Uh, depending on, you know, if it doesn't actually quite reach where you need it to reach or actually you could go a little bit wider. Um, and in some cases you could do this as part of the day itself or, of course, in advance as well to the planting event, depending on how many people you have volunteering on the day. And the planting itself is fairly simple. Dig out a square hole. I mentioned this yesterday. It's a tried and tested formula and much better for the sh much better shape for the roots. You kind of want to go 40 by 40 centimeters or if easier to kind of get your eye in twice the size of the root ball. However, make sure the hole isn't too deep around 25 to 30 centimeters and aim to plant just above the the root flare and try and create that kind of root flare position. Tamper down and backfill uh, a little as you're planting it in as well, bearing in mind you don't want the soil to go up too much into the trunk as the trunk needs to breathe just like our skin. Again, don't add compost to the hole, just use the soil that has been dug out. And the reason we recommend uh, you know, not using compost is because it can create a luxury space if you like, um, and the roots tend don't tend to kind of go further than the compost, creating issues with stunting um, and yeah, growth further down the line. Compost also seems to hold more water and we would recommend avoiding the whips having wet feet where possible as this may create, you know, rotting issues and then you're going to have to replace the whips as you go. So avoid compost. However, do mulch the, the uh, plantage tree once it's in as this will help to improve the soil over time. This could be through wood, trip, wood chip, I should say, straw or grass clippings. But just be aware that if you do use mulch, try and keep reapplying it to suppress other plant species. You may also need to clear or cut back the base of the whip as other plant species, um, as you move forward, will be making use of the higher nutrients that you've um, added really to that space. You don't want other plant species, you know, things like um, thistle, nettle, broadleaf dock, that sort of thing. You don't want them to start out competing the whips that you've planted and take over that space. Sounds like a, a big job, but we really don't recommend spraying with herbicide or pesticide. Um, so control this problem where possible by hand and reapplying mulch regularly can help um, this issue. Staking is important too, particularly for whips to ensure the base of the tree doesn't move too much in the wind or bad weather. You want to kind of go 90 centimetres in length and then use a buckle tie to attach them to together to create that solid structure. You can also protect the entire hedgerow with fencing as well. But this can be a little bit of an expensive option. So make sure that it is actually necessary. For example, will your hedgerow be vulnerable to grazers such as deer or in a busy public space? 
If you do need to use protecting fences, then place these around one meter out to allow the hedgerow to grow. You don't want to put them really close in and then find as the hedgerow grows, it's kind of taking over the fence and then you've got kind of management problems and the fence will start to break up. And where possible, avoid spiral guards. I've just popped a picture on the right there. A really good hedgerow project. They've got that staggering two row hedgerow going in, but they have used spiral guards. And in some cases, if they're left on for too long, they can create that kind of leggy hedgerow, that structure that I suggested avoiding earlier on in the webinar, because you want your hedgerow to be really dense at the bottom. So things like, you know, smaller mammals, hedgehogs can use it as that corridor. And, you know, they can safely move from space to space. And up in the corner there, um, I've just put a handy document that Natural England have. It's like an 18 common FAQ uh, toolkit. So you can go on there. There's loads of answers to questions that you might have when thinking about hedgerow planting. Definitely something I recommend to look at before you get going with your planting event. And now your hedgerow is in, it really is important that community group has built in future management plans. So I am going to spend a little bit of time thinking about future management because 50% of our hedgerows have been lost since the 1950s. And some of this is really due to either over or under management. And you've probably seen this again when you're out and about um, hedgerows that are not looking in good condition. It's generally because of management issues. For example, if your hedgerow isn't managed at all, um, it will succeed into a line of trees. So sometimes there's that idea that for it to be good for wildlife, just let it be, let it grow. But hedgerows are a man-made habitat, so they do need to be managed. If left, they'll just grow and grow and grow and they'll all become mature trees and you'll have a line of trees. And this means that that ecotone habitat I discussed earlier in the webinar would be lost. That density, that structure, that shape would be lost, which, of course, is vital to the wildlife we're trying to support. You know, a line of trees doesn't create so much of a good wildlife corridor, doesn't have so many nesting opportunities. There's less available in terms of forage um, and the structure is just lost over time. So, yeah, it's really looking at you do need to manage this as you go forward. And then there's the kind of flip side of, of that coin as well. If overmanaged, the hedgerows will become threatened. Um, so it may become leggy, sparse, and then gaps will eventually be created. So you can see that um, in, you know, loads of areas of our landscape where old established hedgerows have got now kind of gaps creating in them that are getting wider and wider. And that's just because um, the species have been overmanaged and they've started to decline and, you know, die back. And although, of course, deadwood habitat is a really important part of our hedgerows, we do want to keep our hedgerows managed and kind of rejuvenated over time. So I'm going to go through kind of a list of key management recommendations, although this will need to, need to be adapted to your project and space. And I would recommend checking out PTES, so the People's Trust for Endangered Species um, information. Uh, they have a fabulous hedgerow management cycle toolkit. Here you can see a diagram that they've produced, which again is really, really useful. So. For newly planted hedgerows, yearly cutting and trimming is important to encourage the whips to put energy into kind of that lateral growing rather than shooting straight up into that kind of tree uh, formation. So really early on, you want to be thinking about trimming off the um, kind of new growth or budded area in the kind of winter season. So when you get to that kind of new growing season, it starts to think about growing out laterally, putting out more branches, you know, in other ways rather than just straight up into the sky. But then that kind of changes as your hedgerow becomes established. You know, you don't really want to continue cutting on a yearly basis and you start to move into a two or three year rotation across the hedgerow. And in many cases, hedgerow species will only flower and fruit on the second year wood. So you don't want to lose that cycle. If you were to manage it every year, 
it might not flower or fruit as much. So say you had, um, you know, a 30 meter length hedgerow, you might do a 10 meter part of it the first year, the other 10 meter part the second year, and the last 10 meter part the third year. And then you get into this lovely rotation. You're not having to manage the whole hedgerow in one big go, it's going through cycles. And again, that adds to the kind of diversity as well of your structure. And then when you are managing it on that rotation, it really is important to not cut to the same height every single year. Allow them to gradually get bigger and grow. Otherwise, again, you'll create legginess and gaps. And you might have seen hedgerows that almost have that kind of knuckle-like growth at the top. And this is because the hedgerow is being cut at the exact same place each year. So let them grow higher and wider by increasing your cut by about five or 10 centimeters each year. And this will avoid structural damage and it promotes continuous flowering and fruiting. And we also recommend cutting later in the winter. So, you know, kind of January, February to ensure that there is forage available over the winter months. And of course, you know that you do need to take into account um, that there's going to be kind of no obstruction or, or soil compaction um, if you're doing it in January and February. But, you know, early management in September and October uh, just means that you're getting rid of so many different fruiting varieties that particularly our birds rely on. So cut later in the winter where possible. Um, However, even with all these management techniques, hedgerows do need hedge laying to keep them fresh kind of from time to time. This helps a hedgerow rejuvenate and that's kind of the top bit of that cycle there. Um, this is a rather skillful technique, but it involves cutting the larger stems three quarters of the way through, bent over, bound and place. And this helps the hedge thicken up at the base again. Um, and there are some great examples of hedge laying at our Chigwell Meadows Nature Reserve. So I would definitely recommend taking a trip there if you want to go and see um, what hedge laying looks like. But if you don't want to go down the route of hedge laying, um, there is also options where you can coppice as well your hedgerow. So bringing it back down to the base, taking out your stems and allowing it to regenerate from that woody base. Um, yeah, so you've got the new shoots going up, you're creating that dense area um, and you're not having kind of leggy hedges that are getting too high um, and forming kind of a tree like structures. And then, of course, not forgetting about the ecotome. It's not just about managing your hedgerow. Manage the hedgerow margin, which includes scrub and grass and management. You don't want to have a really kind of intense management right up to the edge of your habitat. You want it to be that kind of natural transition from the hedge right through to the grassland where you have that hedgerow edge where you're going to get, you know, lots of different wildflower species. You're going to get some, you know, reshooting and suckers coming out from the hedgerows, which again, is just another way of providing that kind of shrubby, scrubby denseness for, for nesting birds. So, it's just looking at that margin as well and, you know, kind of managing maybe half a metre or a metre out. So you haven't got kind of a stark contrast between, you know, freshly cut lawn to then hedgerow. And all this can be achieved through monthly or seasonal work parties. You know, get your community group together and plan out when and how you will manage the hedgerow together. And that takes me back to the funding. When planning and looking at your budget, try to include the equipment you may need, as well as, you know, you know, other things um, that might be, you know, training. You might want to go on training courses for coppicing or hedge laying. Don't just think about the trees. And of course, if you're signed up to Team Wilder as well, you do get access to um, free workshops. You know, we looked at um, surveying healthy hedgerows uh, earlier this year. We've had a look at kind of woodland condition assessments. Hopefully at some point we'll be able to have kind of hedge laying and coppicing uh, workshops on as well. So. Yeah, kind of look at that. Um, do you need that in your budget? What equipment might you need to actually take that management forward? That's a really important step.
And, you know, think about your volunteers. I'm sure they're going to want to be kind of upskilled in this area as well if they're looking at managing a hedgerow. So it's just baking that into your plan as you move forward, um, because hedgerows, particularly hedgerows, are not just about the planting. It's about how you move forward to make sure they're a haven for wildlife and also, you know, so people can enjoy them. And as I mentioned, if you did come to our Healthy Hedgerow Survey workshop this year, then you will have already have had a chance to survey a hedgerow for its health and future management. But if you weren't, we have this fantastic video from PTES just detailing how you would survey your hedgerow as it establishes and right into the future to help you understand the condition is in and the management you can use going forward. So you know, I'm not expecting you to go out and know exactly, you know, what condition your hedgerow is in. So this survey really gives you an idea um, as to what condition it's in and what you might need to do within that hedgerow management cycle. And again, we're always here for questions as well, site visits. I can come and look at your newly planted hedgerow. If you've already planted the hedgerow last year, I can come and look what's that kind of future management that you need to put in place. So let's have a look at that video. It's got a really funky tune, um, but can give you an idea of how you go out and serve the hedgerows. And lots of people really enjoy, enjoy doing this. It's a great volunteering opportunity. So I would really recommend going and having a look at that website. Um, it's a fantastic resource and can really help you with the management of your hedgerow. 
And that really is your introduction to hedgerow creation, whether you are in a rural or an urban setting. Um, and this has been recorded, so don't worry, I'm not expecting you to remember everything we discussed today. Um, this will be available in your next Team Wilder newsletter. Um, but we do have time for questions, so um, you know, let me know if you've got any questions about a hedgerow that you recently planted, one that you're planning to do. I know the planting season is coming up, but yeah, just let me know if you've got any questions or, of course, drop me uh, an email as well. OK, well, if that is everything, then, yeah, thank you very much for coming along this evening. I hope it was useful and I look forward to hearing about your Hedro Creations project as you move forward. Um, in the meantime, yep, see you later. Enjoy the rest of your evening.